Hey friends, today's episode is brought to you by Engageo, the leader in account-based marketing and sales with their all-in-one solution. Are you familiar with account-based marketing and sales? I mean, if you're selling to the enterprise, to big business, account-based strategies are the new wave of doing business. If you're selling to the enterprise, if you're dealing with multiple decision makers, if you need to close larger deals, then an account-based approach is a necessity. However, while there's a lot of talk out there about account-based marketing and sales, there's very little actionable advice on strategies and tactics you need to take. So our friends at Engageo asked dozens of independent sales and marketing experts, leaders in their fields, to contribute their recommendations about what you need to know to get started with it. And Engageo has compiled the collective wisdom of these experts into a most comprehensive guide that reveals everything you need to know about using account-based strategies to win bigger deals. It's called The Clear and Complete Guide to Account-Based Sales Development. It's free, and you need it. So head over to Engageo.com forward slash Accelerate and grab your copy today. That's Engageo.com forward slash Accelerate. Okay, let's do the show. It's time to Accelerate. Hey, friends, this is Andy. Welcome to episode 490 of Accelerate, the sales podcast of record, where I hold in-depth conversations with today's leading experts in sales, marketing, and leadership six days a week. Man, oh man, I'm, I'm excited about talking with my guest today. Joining me on the show is Barry Schwartz. Barry is the author of one of my all-time favorite business books titled The Paradox of Choice. Now, if you're in sales and you want to learn about how buyers make decisions, well, that's really a requirement. You should learn about how buyers want to make decisions. Then this book is really an absolute must read. And if you haven't read it, in fact, I'd encourage you to put the podcast on pause, go to Amazon, order it, and then come back and listen to my conversation with Professor Schwartz. I'm really looking forward to it. So let's jump into it. Barry Schwartz, welcome to Accelerate. It's a pleasure to be with you. So uh, we were just talking before we came on there. You've you've actually transplanted yourself across the country because you know, I always identified you with being in at Swarthmore in Philadelphia. Well, I spent forty five years at Swarthmore, the only job I ever had, and my wife and I moved to the Bay Area to be closer to our family this past summer. So yes, this is the beginning. Of my, this is the first day of the rest of my life. Sort of. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, it, you've picked a, a great neighborhood to be in, and and. Uh, yeah, so I'll be on your neck of the woods in a couple of weeks. So, um, yeah, you inspired me. I, I first saw you on a TED Talk, I think, on YouTube, and led me to go out and buy The Paradox of Choice <laughs> immediately and read it. And uh, very eye-opening. I mean, for somebody who'd been in sales and you know, an influence professional, as, as Robert Cialdini talks about, for a long time, this, there was so much new in there. I just uh, couldn't wait to get through it. So I wanted to talk about some of the things in the book, especially sure. the parts about decision-making, because I think this is mm-hmm. this is so critical for sellers, obviously, marketers, to really understand how people are going about making decisions, the things that really influence them. And, and um, you talk about decision-making, starting with understanding what I want. And Maybe you could explain all the sort of the concepts of the experienced utility, expected utility, and remembered utility, and how those sort of come into conflict. Certainly. This, so this is work that was done by Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize uh, in economics about a decade ago. And the idea is this. Um, uh, if you think about making a decision, any decision you make is a prediction. You know, how much satisfaction am I going to get out of X or Y? How much am I going to enjoy this restaurant or this vacation or this uh, cell phone, whatever? So you make a prediction. What's the prediction based on? Well, it's typically at least partly based on your memory of past relevant experiences. And so you use your memory from the past to make a prediction about the future. The question is, how accurate is your memory? of past experiences, and the answer Kahneman showed is not very. What happens is that you have the experience, and what you take away from the experience is two moments in time, what he calls the peak and the end. The moment of most intense experience, the peak, and how the experience ends. And you essentially average those two moments, and everything else about the experience is irrelevant. And so if you have a mediocre experience with a good end, you're more likely to do it again. 
if you have a great experience with a bad end, you're less likely to do it again. Uh, I like uh, your I like your your example of the the one week vacation that has great moments but ends on a real up note or with a real bang. Maybe you're kayaking with dolphins in Hawaii, and then you'll <laughs> remember that more positively than a three week vacation that also had great moments but ended badly. Maybe with you missed your flight home or something. Exactly. And, you know, it's funny because I, I, I was invited to give a talk um, several years ago at a lovely, lovely hotel in Palm Beach, Florida called The Breakers, mm-hmm. one of the nicest hotels I've ever seen. And I was seated at dinner with the CEO of the hotel and I sort of gave him a preview of what I was going to be talking about. And I mentioned that I was overwhelmed that when I checked in, there were like eight people who milled around to take care of me. And I said, you know, that's a waste. <laughs> you want to make sure that the, this, the end of the stay is great, not the beginning. And he got all interested because no doubt he thought if you get things started on the right foot, it, you'll, you'll interpret everything else that happens more positively. And that, you know, sort of may be true. But he completely neglected the importance of how things end. And of course, when I checked out, it was lonely me all by myself. Nobody interested in helping me. (laughs) They already had your money. You can't control what happens to me on the way to the airport or whether my flight's delayed. But to the extent he can control the experience, making sure it ends well is more important than making sure it begins well. And he was flabbergasted that that might be true. Now, whether he changed his practices, I don't know. But yes, uh, the duration of the vacation, most especially, is of no consequence. And you, you, you try convincing people that a one-week vacation and a two-week vacation are basically just as good as each other. And you're better off taking several short vacations than one <laughs> long one. I have had no luck convincing people of this. And that, of course, is the deeper point. The deeper point about decision making is that we are, by and large, as decision makers, clueless about the most, the most profound influences on our decisions. We think we're doing it for one reason. We're, it's really another thing that's influencing the decision and our response to the decision which means that we're at the mercy of marketers who might know us better than we know ourselves. And we're likely often to make bad decisions because we make them for the wrong reasons. Um, well, I was going to say, let me ask you a question about the, the peak end rule. Because you know, I was thinking about its applicability to, to business-to-business decision-making and mm-hmm. in sales. And I guess one of the questions I'd have is, because is, I've seen this with some companies that I've worked with, uh, consulting with, and so on, is that you know, what they found is is they obviously couldn't predict, for, you know, we, we focus a lot on buying experience these days, right? You know, it's all the talk in sales and marketing. It's all about the buying experience. If you're in crowded, competitive markets, you know, the, your differentiator is, is the buying experience. So if we look at that as an experience, then it seems like the peak event could be any step of that buying process. I, I was talking about one company I was working with where, you know, when they got a lead coming in the door, they were so fast to respond with a great salesperson who could answer the customer's questions quickly. It's that first moment of contact, even if it took place three weeks before they made the decision, that was hugely memorable for the customer. And that was that was almost decisive in many cases, mm-hmm. uh, that responsiveness up front. So I always thought that was sort of analogous to a peak event. And you know, they'd finish strongly through the sales process. But you know, is that relevant in that respect? Well, you know, it, it shows you that real real life is more complicated than laboratory experiments because you're describing a situation where there is really a sequence of decisions. You know, the decision about whether or not to buy is something that will be extended in time. Mm-hmm. So, so the, you know, whereas what Kahneman was talking about is a discrete experience that has mm-hmm. a beginning and an end. So here you want to get started on the right foot because you want people to take the next step. Right. So quite apart from the, you know, how hedonically important it is to have a good first contact, it is certainly important to have a good first contact because it increases the chances that you'll have a second contact. Um, and in that sense, I think, you know, the old saw about making a good first impression really matters because most of the decisions we make actually are composed of many smaller decisions that lead us, 
you know, from start to finish. And mm-hmm. It's not true when you're deciding what to eat in a restaurant. And it's not true in the studies that Kahneman did where the experience in question lasts 30 seconds or a couple of minutes. Right. But it is true of many of the decisions that we actually face in real life. So the peak end rule, I believe, is true, but it's not the only thing that determines your uh, evaluation of the experience. And so it's not the only thing that the person trying to lure right. you should be paying attention to. Right. So, and obviously, again, a lot written these days about the, the role of emotion versus logic and decision making. I mean, it seems like Kahneman is really talking about that as well. Well, yeah, but I, I think that's the wrong way to think about it, although that is the way it's usually characterized. It's, about, it's really about the role of automatic unconscious processes as opposed to conscious deliberative processes. So his system one versus system two. Exactly. Type. So right. it may or may not be emotional, system one. There's an awful lot of stuff that he describes as a system one that has nothing to do with emotion. You know, you get asked a question and an answer immediately pops into your head uh, and there's no emotion about it. Uh, And the question is, do you essentially use your first answer or do you reflect on the output of the automatic system? So there's a classic example, a bat and a ball cost a dollar (laughs) ten. The bat cost, you know this, the bat cost a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Now, that's not exact. That doesn't require differential equations. Right. Yet the majority of people at prestigious universities get this question wrong. They say the ball, the bat costs a dollar and the ball costs a dime. Right. That's like the automatic answer. And the people who get it right, and the right answer is the bat costs a dollar five and the ball costs costs a nickel. Right. The people who get it right, often the first answer that comes to them is the bat costs a dollar and the ball costs a dime. But then they say, wait a minute, let me think about this. So the point is that everybody goes through pretty much the same automatic process and people differ in whether the first answer is the final answer. But my point here is that there's nothing at all emotional about that. As Kahneman says, you know, the world asks us a hard question, we answer an easier one, without realizing that the question we answer is not the one that we were asked. So I think that much more general than emotional versus rational or logical is automatic versus deliberative. And this is the sense in which, you know, sort of Freud had it right a hundred years ago when he said consciousness is the tip of an iceberg. He had it wrong because he thought that the unconscious was motivated. We actually kept things out of consciousness because they were too painful for us to contemplate. Kahneman's point, and lots of other people, Mm -hmm. is that unconscious processes simply dominate our mental life. Right. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, I'd always thought that's a dollar in the balls. Right. And that's it. And then, you know, do you, is that your, you know, is that your final answer or do you go further? So I think that's a a more uh, accurate way to think about it is to what extent are we influenced by automatic processes? If you walk into a clothing store and you see a suit that's $3,000 and then you see a suit that's $1,500, your assessment of the second suit will be that it's probably a pretty good buy because it's half the price of the one that's $3,000. If instead you see a suit that's 800 and then you see that same one that's 1500, you'll go, wow, that's a lot of money to spend. Um, There's nothing emotional about that either. You're assessing the price of the $1,500 suit in a context that's influenced by the other things that are around. Yeah, the anchoring concept. And textual evaluation is going to determine to a large extent whether you buy the damn suit or not. So if we look at look at the the automatic versus deliberative process again, taking it back to because again we're audience is largely business to business, is mm-hmm. so yeah we've we've got the sequence of events we go through that's you know a buying process that the the prospect has. We spend it seems like as an industry we spend a lot of time sort of saying okay well, what are the things we can do that move the prospect through these initial steps on more of an automatic basis as opposed to a deliberative, right? I mean, it seems like there's a lot of effort spent to try to sort of keep things in the the system one sphere versus system two. Mm -hmm. 
I think that's probably right. Unless, of course, you know, look, if you think you've really got the best product, then arguably you want the decision to be as deliberative as possible. You know, you kind of want people to put the alternatives mm. side by side against one another and do a direct comparison because you're confident that you'll win such a comparison. Um, and whereas if you're relying on automatic processes, who the hell knows what's going to influence you to give my my product a better or worse evaluation than my competitors. But, you know, most people don't aren't in that position. They may have a product that's in some respects better than the competition in other respects worse. Mm -hmm. So you want to. So what you want to do is make the respects in which your product is better, extremely salient. Make it vivid when you describe it exemplify it, examples, particular examples, particular past customers who have bought this product and found it incredibly uh, satisfying, meeting their needs, are more powerful than sort of pallid statistics about uh, overall efficiency uh, gains that are associated with using this product. Um, so come up with some vivid examples, testimonials, um, that's one thing. Another thing we know is what's called negativity bias. The, the bad things that we experience have a much bigger impact on us than comparable than good things of comparable magnitude. It feels roughly twice as bad to lose $10 as it feels good to win $10. Right, right. So what that means is that if there are negatives associated with your product, they're going to have a big impact on your customers and you want to find a way uh, to help your customers discount them or reinterpret them or, you know, you package things so that the negative is combined with a positive and that when you put the two of them together, the net is positive rather than negative. Is this making sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, you, you, you talk about that. the negatives to stand alone. Right. Because then they have a big impact and it's hard for you to overcome that with positives. Much better to put the negative and the positive together into a package. Right. So you and you talk about in the book about making again vivify or you know make more vivid examples is, and I think that really accounts for a lot of the the trend towards storytelling in sales yep. these days. Because you know, they suddenly if you're relating something to somebody that they're familiar with, then yeah, that's a much more vivid example. They can right. picture themselves in the story that uh, perhaps could crowd out some of the negatives as you talked about. Now, the question, and I don't know have the answer to this, the question is that when you're focused on business to business, there's a presumption that you're, try, you're selling to people who are expert, sophisticated, and will cut through <laughs> all this crap to get to the essence, right? So you might think that the kind of stuff I write about in the book and that you know, decision scientists have been studying psychologists in the last 20 years just doesn't apply when your customer is savvy. And it's an empirical question uh, whether it does. It seems to me quite possible that people who have a lot of experience engaging in these kinds of transactions are less susceptible to non-rational influences than the rest of us, meaning not that they don't have those automatic responses, but they don't let those responses end the process. Mm -hmm. So my guess is that is that it, it's harder to use the kinds of factors that I write about to influence the behavior of customers when the customers are extremely savvy. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, Simonson and Rosen in their book Absolute Value sort of make that argument. I think that that uh, yeah, more sophisticated buyers with access to a broader range of of information actually can predict the experienced utility more accurately than they could in the past. Yeah, that's probably true. But on the other hand, just to give you a counterexample, um, uh, Staples, the office supply store, used to have a print catalog. Boy, <laughs> print catalog, it's like, it's like a horse and buggy. Uh, I remember those were delivered to the house, yes. And they were delivered to the house, but mostly they were delivered to businesses. And they were gigantic, sort of like the old Sears catalog. Mm -hmm. And it cost them a fortune to produce and to, and to mail. So they decided that they would reduce the number of options in many product categories and in that way uh, lower the production and postage costs. They assumed that they would lose business that way. 
because there would be options excluded that people had previously purchased. They hoped and expected that what they saved in back, you know, back office costs would more than compensate for what they lost in sales. But they were absolutely convinced that that reducing the number of options available in the catalog would cost them sales. Now we're talking about savvy and sophisticated sellers selling to savvy and sophisticated buyers. Mm-hmm. What my book would suggest is that indeed, if you reduce the number of options in these categories, you will increase sales, not decrease them, because you make it easier for people to make decisions. They don't walk away paralyzed. They actually pull the trigger. And that's what happened. In every category, everyone without exception, where they reduced the number of options, sales went up. And this is largely sophisticated sellers selling to sophisticated buyers mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you would expect would not be affected by something like an overwhelming or they wouldn't be overwhelmed by large choice sets because they have so much experience doing this and yet they were and so that leads me to think that even if it's true that the business to business context um, people are savvier and can anticipate these psychological effects and discount them they probably can't discount them completely. So they probably you know, discount them partially. So in the example of the suits, the $800 suit and right. the $3,000 suit, right. you're looking at the $800 suit and then you look at the $1,500 suit and you say, hey, that's, that's a lot of money. And then you go, wait a minute, I'm probably influenced by having just seen the $800 suit. Is it really a lot of money? I'm thinking it's a lot of money, but I've been anchored on a relatively inexpensive suit and I need to adjust my judgment. So you adjust. But what the literature says is you, nobody ever adjusts fully. So even though you say, you know, to yourself, $1,500 isn't that much, it's just in comparison to 800 that I thought it was, you'll adjust it so that it doesn't feel quite so expensive, but it will still feel expensive. Mm-hmm. And whereas when you saw a $3,000 suit and you go through the same process, you say, God, the reason I think 1500 is cheap is that I saw 3000 Again, you'll adjust, but you won't adjust completely. So even though you think you have neutralized these, these context effects and are able to evaluate the $1,500 suit on its own, you haven't neutralized the context effects. You're still influenced by them. And uh, and you're completely unaware that you're still influenced by it. <laughs> so I I think there are limits to what expert to the extent to which expertise overcomes some of the things I write about. But as I say, it's an empirical question. Um, by and large, the research has not been done with savvy participants. It's been done, you know, with college students or nowadays done on MTurk. Um, so who knows uh, how different some of these things would look. If you were talking, uh, studying people who basically buy stuff for a living. Right. Well, I think one of the things we're seeing in the business to business world is especially in some larger enterprise sales and complex system sales is that since the acquisitions happen so infrequently that the buyers themselves really don't have a track record of buying well, this that's type of product thing. and service. So, so it's always sort of ad hoc to some degree every time they go through the, the process. No, no, and that's an interesting point. Um, uh, I was once part of a group that spent uh, several days working on a topic that's really largely unstudied, which is um, what do we know about how people make make high stakes decisions? Mm -hmm. And the point is not just that the stakes were high, but rather that they tend to be infrequent, often you know hard to reverse. But you haven't had a lot of practice buying houses, right? Uh, or taking jobs. And the result is that there's a limit to how savvy you can be with these decisions. And of course, they're the most consequential decisions in our lives. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So we're, we're expert at buying groceries where mistakes are always are trivial because we do it every week. We're not experts on buying insurance, houses, cars, and stuff like that. Uh, where we need the experience most because the consequences are most substantial. Well, that's why. Fact, this is also essentially unstudied since it's not real easy to bring people into a laboratory and have them buy a house. Right, and buy a house. Or, well, and that's why, you know, back in the 
before the breakup of IBM, when they were so dominant in the market in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, is that, you know, the rephrase, as you always heard, was no one got fired for buying IBM, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, those the, so to your point, is sort of the risk mitigation. These were, you know, unstudied, unpracticed uh, buying habits that people want to take the least risk approach to it. Yep, yep. So talk about risk. I mean, you, you in this sort of dealing with the issue of framing that you bring up about the decisions and saying that, you know, the, when making a choice among various alternatives that have risk associated with it, we prefer a small, sure gain to a larger, uncertain one. Right. Uh, now, this, again, is just empirical, and Con- Kahneman won the Nobel Prize principally for this discovery and his form formalizing it into what came to be called prospect theory, which mm-hmm. he did with, with Amos Tversky, his longtime collaborator. Um, but the idea is that yeah, $10 for sure is better than $20 with a probability of 0.5 um, right. in general. And the reason is, and you can derive this straight from the diminishing marginal utility. Mm-hmm. $20 isn't twice as good as 10 and yet you have half as good a chance. Your expected value is, by, because of the probability, your expected values are the same. But since $20 isn't twice as good as 10 if you win the twenty dollars, you won't feel twice as well off. Right. So better to take better to take the small certain gain rather than the large uncertain one. So this is sort of standard stuff. What they showed, however, is that when you're contemplating losses, uh, you become risk seeking, and you do it for the same reason. There's diminishing marginal disutility associated with losses. Losing twenty dollars isn't twice as bad as losing ten. So ten dollar loss for sure versus a fifty fifty chance to lose twenty is a good bet because losing twenty won't hurt twice as much as losing ten. Mm-hmm. And so you get this curve that's sort of you know there's a reflection point uh, at uh, at the origin. Right. And with losses, we're risk averse. We're risk seeking. With gains, we're risk averse. And the critical thing is that where the neutral point is, is easily manipulated by the language you use to describe the options. So, for example, uh, is uh, um, a surcharge for using a credit card a loss? Or is a discount, is, is there a discount for paying cash? Right. You know, gas is three dollars a gallon, three ten if you use a credit card. Are you losing ten cents a gallon for using a credit card, or are you gaining ten cents a gallon for paying cash? Essentially, people will react very differently to these two descriptions, but they're two descriptions of exactly the same thing. And what you do is you establish the neutral point. If the neutral point, if the base price is the credit card price. 310, right. then you're saving a dime a gallon for using cash. If the baseline price is the cash price, then you're paying a convenience charge for using your credit card. And the language with which these things are described will influence whether people see themselves as potentially gaining something or potentially losing something. Um, so it's not simply an, a, a sort of, a, it's not always just objective facts about the world. It's often how the facts about the world get framed, put into context and described. And that, you know, economists had nothing to say about any of that. Uh, and, uh, and it's of monumental significance so, uh, to these decisions. Right. So one time it's- uh, several times is, is with people I've worked with, and I remember one mentor in particular is saying, you know, when you're selling something relatively large, complex to to a, you know relatively inexperienced buyer because they haven't had the experience, and there's certainly a risk associated with it. That you know, your best strategy going forward is try to start your relationship with the smallest transaction possible, right? To sort of inoculate them against the risk, and then you know, replicate decisions thereafter. As opposed to trying to get the the big decision, I mean, is that something that makes yeah, inherent it, sense? It may also be true, though not for not for this kind of reason, for a different sort of reason. This is something social psychologists have studied and called the foot in the door technique. You ask people if they'll put a little campaign sign in their living room window 
uh, and they agree. And then a week later, you ask them if you can put a six foot by six foot sign on their lawn and they agree. If they hadn't agreed to putting the small sign in their window, they would have kicked you out when you asked them to put a six by six foot sign sure. on their lawn. So sort of the, the consistency theory. Yeah, sort of. But, yeah. you know, easy to make a small commitment. And once you've made a small commitment, it becomes a lot easier to make a big one. So that makes perfectly good sense, although I don't think it's really necessarily about, you know, sort of framing things as potential gains or potential losses. Okay. All right. So last last question is, and you had, uh, hopefully it's <laughs> last question, man, is you had talked about diminishing marginal utility. And you had written one of my favorite parts of your book, writing about maximizers and satisficers. Um, and there's a lot of stuff being written these days we see in the sales world about rejecting the good enough decision, you know, the good enough decision is not good enough and people should be, you know, striving to, <laughs> to get beyond that. And it seems clear to me that the good enough decision is where most people, as you talk about, it's really a maximizing decision at, in many points. Well, yes, I think that it's a horrible advice to tell people that good enough, the good enough decision is not good enough. It's a recipe for misery. It's a recipe for error. Um, and, you know, in many situations in life, you can't even calculate what a maximum, what a, what a maximizing outcome would be, because you can't really attach probabilities to outcomes. And if you can't attach probabilities to outcomes, you're just guessing about what the expected values are, and thus just guessing about what a maximum is. The amount of effort involved in finding the best is overwhelming in a complicated world. Mm -hmm. And good enough is almost always good enough. And it, what makes sense is to, is to be open to raising your standards as you continue to make these kinds of decisions. But telling people that they should never be settling for good enough is, is just the, wor the worst possible advice you can give them, <laughs> in my opinion. Good. All right. Well, with that, now I have to fetch my grandson. You got to go fetch your grandson. So, Barry, thank you very much for spending time with us. So, tell folks how they can uh, find out more about you and your work. Well, if they Google, they can watch the three TED Talks on the TED website, uh, and they can Google me, and that will take them to my website, which doesn't have much on it. But when they Google me, my name appears all over the place. All right. And if you're in sales marketing, you need to check out the Paradox of Choice. Must must read book from my perspective. So. Barry, thank you again for spending time with me today. My pleasure. And friends, thank you for spending this time with us today. Please come back. Join us again tomorrow. Thanks again for joining me. Until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everybody. Good selling.